There is a curse on this place. I feared as much. Maybe it's a witch book. No such thing. What about the Witch of the Woods? I told you. She's coming of age. so that we might live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we are here with the fantastic director, producer, and writer. He's got a brand new film coming out called Queen of Bones, and it is Robert Bedreau. Could you say hello to everybody for us, Robert? Hi, everybody. Now, you are a fantastic, uh, accomplished artist. I loved your film, Born to be Blue. I love that movie. Um, and this movie... But it is, it's very different from that, but it follows suit in that you have these very talented people all making a project that I find to be uh, unnerving, I think would be the correct word. What went into wanting to make this film and getting this cast together? Yeah, I mean, this is the first script that I didn't write. I had written my previous features, and so I was really excited by interpreting someone else's script. Michael Bergner wrote the script, and I always like to try to explore different genres that I haven't done before. Um, and this was a film uh, that that has, you know, a genre element. It's still, it's still you know, in a lot of ways, like, uh, you know, a family drama, but it, it allowed me to explore genre. It allowed me to explore the 1930s. I, I love period. I hadn't done that before. Um, and I just, I love the, uh, I love that era, that that Steinbeckian kind of era. And then it, I, I thought it was very unique to, to blend that era with this kind of supernatural, uh, these kind of folk elements. Um, and I, I also have a, I'm a father and I have a, a daughter who's, you know, uh, approaching teenage years. And I think having a young heroine at the center of the story was something that was really inspiring for me. I love that because I also have a, uh, I have a teenager in my house. He's 14, and I tell you, it, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, trust me on that one. Uh, what, what went about getting this fantastic cast together? You have several big names. You have Oscar-nominated J uh, Jacob Tremblay. You have Martin Freeman. Uh, you have Taylor Schilling. And, of course, I wasn't really familiar with Julia Butters' work, but she is the center of this thing. Can you talk yeah. about putting the cast together? Well, yeah, putting the cast together, I mean – the, the leads are the kids. And so I was very fortunate in that my number one choice was Julia Butters and my number one choice was Jacob Tremblay. And I reached out to both of them and they both responded. And, you know, I, I loved what Julia Butters did in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood opposite Leo. I mean, she was only eight at the time, but the, the way that she was able to hold those scenes with him was just like, I, I still couldn't believe it at age eight. And, you know, now she's, 13 or 14 when we shot our film, she was 12. And then Jacob, who I've seen a bit more, he did a great project called Room Back and then a lot of other things. I thought they'd be a great match. They really felt like twins. And so to me, that was the heart of it. And then of course, I've always been a fan of Martin Freeman. I, I loved his work in Fargo and you know so many other things. And so I also like the idea of getting a guy like Martin who you um, often see as a, as a nicer guy and kind of playing a bit against type. Um, and and so we reached out to Martin and he responded. I, I felt very fortunate, I think, because we had a strong material and I had good partners in Appian Way. Um, you know, cast had good reads. And then Taylor was kind of the last person to come on. She came in quite late in the game um, and, and she was great, too. I've always been a, a big fan of um, of Orange is the New Black. So, so yeah. No, I love that. I, I love 
Uh, I love how the cast worked together. Now, this premiered back in September of last year at TIFF. How exciting was that to be debuting in your home country, Canada, uh, first? And now you're here at Santa Barbara. Yeah, TIFF, TIFF is always fun. I mean, I've, I've played at TIFF in the past, and you're, it's kind of home turf. And so, but to be honest, TIFF was a bit unusual this year because it was the strike year. You know, we weren't allowed to have cast. We didn't really have any, uh, you know, it became a very low key, strange affair. And so in, in a way, like it was still fun, but we weren't kind of in a way allowed to celebrate the film in, a, in the proper way. And so bringing it to Santa Barbara was fun because we were allowed to bring cast. We were allowed to be excited. We're allowed to like let the public say what they think. So it was, it's kind of been a nice experience. And I've played Santa Barbara in the past. Uh, I played here on a film called Stockholm, another film I did with Ethan Hawke. And then my, my wife, who's a documentary filmmaker, had a film here. So I've been to Santa Barbara a few times and it's such a beautiful place. And so I was always excited to be up there. And it's a great festival. We've been doing it for about eight years now. They're always, they're always so welcoming to us as writers and as critics. Uh, and they always put such great, oddly not similar films together that you don't think should go together. But when you eat that whole sandwich of the films that play, it just sort of works. And I, that's what I love about the festival is it's so eclectic. Um, yeah. And to see something like this from a director like you who hasn't done, you haven't really done a horror film before, uh, is really, really interesting. Um, you, you said you talked you talked about like liking to play in different genres. What what was for you? What was what was it like to play in that horror genre? Well, first off, I don't really consider it a horror film, um, but I do think you know I think there's elements of folk horror, but folk horror to me is very specific. I think I think horror is tricky because I've never really been that much of a fan of like harder core horror, um, and I think I think people have expectations and can have disappointments if, if they go in expecting a full on horror for this movie and for other movies, to be honest. I, I think in the last, you know, I think there's been a renaissance a bit in folk horror with films like The Witch and what A24 has done, but that goes back to, you know, some of the seventies British films and that happened in nature and witchism. But th those films often achieve more through haunting atmosphere and things like that, as opposed to jump scares like horror. And so this film doesn't really, have jump scares it doesn't have those kind of cheap thrills i mean those aren't actually hard to do but the the film at its core is more of a su supernatural drama with some of those elements i just find as soon as you mention that the expectations go and then people are like well why aren't you delivering something super scary and it wasn't the design it's not like you know we couldn't have done it but that that just wasn't the design but that's that's what attracted me to this was the kind of unique tone of it I think that's fair. I think you are playing in in, a, in that gray area where it's not this like gory thing, but it is. I, I think there are similar tones and similar tunes to the witch. I, you know, I, I think you're you're onto something there with that. I wanted to ask you because the film, uh, what I what I really appreciated about the film more than anything was, I'm I'm a dialogue guy, and I know you're a writer uh, as well. Uh, I appreciate dialogue, and and I can see from watching the film why you liked Michael Bergner's script. There's a real authenticity to the characters in this film. Can you talk about projecting what you saw in that script onto the screen here and making sure you maintain that authenticity? Yeah, I mean, it, it is one of the things with the script that I loved was that language of the 30s. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, it was just about preparing with the actors ahead of time because, uh, you know, on the day with these indie films, time is very tight. And with kids, you only have like a half day to shoot with them. And so, we were pretty precise on this film. We didn't have a lot of time for like improv and going off. So the script really was the gospel. That being said, we we, we jammed a little bit, uh, Martin probably more than any of them, but but it it was very important. And it was it's it was the whole film was much more precise, uh, formally, visually, uh, and even with my collaboration with actors than I have in the past. Which some of my past films have been a little bit looser. But it just depends on on the style of the film and the actors you're working with. Love that. Now, we've talked about your film, and I, so I always like to spend the second half by asking uh, two very, very personal questions that I always like, I always think are kind of a fun time. So the first one I always ask is, who are some people that inspire you, whether that be other artists or people in your life that sort of inspire you to do what you do, you know, make your life worth being, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think creatively, you know, you've got, you've got your kind of touchstone inspirations. For me, I'd say Bob Dylan has always been my biggest kind of muse and vo like inspiration, you know, even though that's music, it's still, 
it's been my biggest inspiration. But then on the film front, you know, it's it's everyone from, you know, modern day people who are still directing like Scorsese going back to the John Fords of the world. Like if you look at something like The Grapes of Wrath, that that was a real inspiration for the movie. That, that Tom look, that, that right, Steinbeckian look. Um, and then uh, yeah, films and then just non-creative inspirations like one's family and kids, you know. Love that. Yeah. And and I, I get that wives and families and kids answer a lot because it, it mostly is true. But I love that you said Bob Dylan, because it, what it proves is that music and film, though different mediums, are not that far apart as to what it takes to, to, to make projects occur and what it takes to get art done. It takes your whole being, your whole heart, your whole soul, everything you have to get a project done. And when I listen to Bob Dylan, I, I, I listen to Dylan, you know, I'm, I'm a little young, I'm a, I'm a younger guy, but I do like, I, I am inspired by the folk of the 60s. Um, you can really hear a true, a, a trueness to everything that he's doing and everything he says. And that's why his songs, even if he's not singing them, tend to resonate with people. You know what I mean? Because some of the best songs uh, ever written were written by him, but not sung by him, which I think yeah. is weird. But, but I think that's so interesting. The, the second question tells me a lot more about you. And it's also a harder question. It's also the hard question I'm going to ask you today. And it is, okay. if you had two films to watch for the rest of your life, and only two, what would you pick from the one? That's a good question. I could only watch two films. Okay. Well, the question is, would I pick my favorite films, or have I seen them so many times I don't need to see them again? That's a good question. I would probably pick, I'd have to pick stuff that's timeless, which which may well be my favorite movies. Um, I'm gonna say w w one film, one of my favorite films is Hitchcock's Vertigo. And, but I think the thing about Vertigo is um, it's kind of enigmatic and mysterious. And, you know, I see different things in it all the time. So I think I could put up with watching it for the rest of my life, just because it's kind of enigmatic. and. You know, my very favorite film is Raging Bull, but I've seen it so many times and I feel like, I don't know if, if I, I I'd probably get depressed if I had to watch Raging Bull just for the rest of my life because it's a very dark, difficult movie. Um, so I'd, I'd probably I'd pick something lighter. Um, uh, uh, that's a good question. What would I pick that would be a little bit lighter that would could, could sustain me? Well... Hmm. There's always a the hard part. I know a film that I'm absolutely a, a adoring this year, and I I don't know if it would be the film I would watch for the rest of my life because I've only seen it once, but I'm going to see it again tomorrow night. Is the Holdovers? I absolutely love the Holdovers in terms of being a comedy that that has pathos and it has, um, you know, it, it's really a drama, but it's wrapped in a comedy, and it it's it's kind of reminds me the best of the '70s movies, but it's still kind of timeless. Um. Right now, I'm just I'm I'm so in love with the holdovers. So maybe that's my quick answer. You know, in in retrospect, there might be something else. But those those would be the things that 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 um I can think of right now. So first of all, I, I you said timeless, and the holdovers is going to maintain. It's going to live past all of us because it's going to be a Christmas classic in no time. It's a fantastic picture. I've seen it three times already. They sent me the Blu-ray though. Uh, oh wow! It's it's a fantastic picture. I love that you picked that because I could rewatch it. It makes you feel good. Yeah. I'm excited. I've seen it a few times, but I'm going to go see it tomorrow night. Like in a war, like uh, with, with Alexander Payne and Paul G. and you know, one of those um, cast and crew kind of screenings on the big screen. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I feel like I could just keep watching that thing. Yeah. We got invited to that. We will not be attending, but we did get invited. Uh, but I, I love that you picked that film. And I, I feel like it's funny. There's a lot of correlation between like the way that you do things and the way that, that Alexander Payne does things, which is to say you have a very vision of what you want to do from, I've seen your other films. I've seen Stockholm. It's a great, great picture. I've seen Born to be Blue. It's a great picture. But I feel like what, it came from a place of you knowing exactly what you wanted to do and being able to do that. And that's what Alexander Payne does. He puts these things together. He knows exactly what he wants it to be. And he doesn't have a vision of it where it's gelatinous in his head and it just sort of has to stay that way but he knows what he wants it to look like at the end of the day and he's and he's and he knows that and that's that's where i'm glad you picked that because i could have seen uh a picture like that coming out of 
out of a director like yourself. Quite oh frankly. God, that would I could make a a holdover. That's that's the kind of movie I'd love to make. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility, Robert. I'll tell you that. I really feel like from from seeing your your diversity, because that's the thing about Alexander Payne, he's a very diverse guy. Election is not the same yeah. as Sideways, is not the same as the, you know, the next film. They're not the same. And none of your films are the same either. I don't I don't watch the films and say, I could tell because of this, this, and this, this, this was a Robert Madrill movie. I could tell it was yours yeah. because your vision is. That keeps things fresh. And it's always, you know, one of my favorite directors was always Howard Hawks, who who played in a lot of different, you know, he was a classic producer director who played in a lot of different genres. And there was a certain kind of uh, straightforward simplicity, naturalism about Howard Hawks. And um, and I've always I've always thought that, I mean, a lot of those directors of that era could do so much. I think that's really appealing. There's a lot, a lot of people nowadays, they get, they get kind of typecast as actors do and they kind of just repeat themselves, which again is to each his own. I just don't find that as, as interesting. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, Rio Bravo is not gentlemen prefer blonde, so I agree with you on that uh, for sure. Now, I want to. We only have a couple minutes left, so I want to give you a, a, a forum to give somebody the thirty second pitch for why they need to check out your brand new film, Queen of Bones. I mean, I think check out Queen of Bones if if you want to be if you want to be entertained with a haunting tale of that that speaks some universal truths about you know families and dark family secrets. Um, I, I mean, that's a pretty easy sale right there. I mean, I like spooky. You like spooky. We like a little bit of the spooky mixed with our family drama. Um, I, I, I mean, that's an easy sell for me. I love that. Um, is there anything else you want to leave the audience with before I let you go, Robert? No, I don't think so. I mean, thank you for taking the time. And I, I'm really proud of the performances in this movie. And I think, you know, Julia, this is the first time Julia's got to be like the true lead in a, in a film. And I think she did an amazing job. And so I hope people come away really, really wowed by her great performance. Um, and yeah, like I said, yeah, enjoy the kind of unique tone that the script presented. I would completely agree with you. Julia is, even at a young age, the heart and soul of this film. Do we have any news on the full release yet or are we still waiting on it? We're still waiting on a date. Falling forward is is just finding the best spot in the calendar, and and hopefully before too long we'll we'll lock in on a date. This year has been a bit screwy because of the strike, but um, it's going to be this year. We're just going to we're going to find out when soon, hopefully. I look forward to it, ladies and gentlemen. It has been Robert Boudreau, the very talented writer and director, but this time he's just directing Queen of Bones, debuting at Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Have a great day, Robert. Thanks so much.